Good morning. All right, so uh, we are going to, uh, we talked about object terminology, we talked about modular programming, OP, and all the good stuff, so we know all those things. Remember, you're going to have a quiz on those coming lab, okay? Uh, quiz number one. Quiz number zero, I haven't prepared it yet, but as soon as I do it, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, again, uh, quiz zero is only on how the course is managed, okay? Hello. Today we're going to talk about pipe references overloading dynamic memory allocation as far as we can go. There's a lot to cover in here. Um, um, the reason is that most of us are not that strong when it comes to uh, pointers. And I just want to clear that thing up and, and get it out of the way so we understand exactly what they are. So we're going to have a quick review on those too. So most probably this is going to leak a little into the lab as usual. Okay. First half of the semester, I have two, uh, two goals. One, to deliver what we have in here. Secondly, to strengthen what we missed from IPC 144. So that's what we are doing. Morning. All right. As usual, like as I mentioned a few times when I start, I create the project and then I'm not going to do it anymore. Um, so again, we create a new project, empty project, uh, start from scratch with C++, no starting files, that's what we are creating. We select a directory and the directory in which we want to be. We are in NAA now. In here, I'm going to create the directory uh, 03, and I'm going to put January 16th over here, and make sure that this is always checked because our solution is our project, and we don't have many projects in a solution. Create it, and then start working with it. Now, what I want to, oh, I have to do an update, nice, soon. Uh, don't ignore these updates, okay? Do it. Uh, they're good for your health. Anyway, so, um, uh, oops, I closed it by mistake. If you close it by mistake, go to View, Solution Explorer. Just want to put it like this. Then I'm going to add a new item. I'll call it prg.cpp. As usual, include IO stream using name uh, using namespace std int main return zero. Now my question over here is, what is a namespace? Do you remember? Oh, I forgot to tell you the rules of the game. So I ask questions. Either you answer or you're not in a mood. You simply say pass if you don't want to answer. So it goes to the next person, OK? Then if the next person says pass, goes to the next person. If the third person says pass, then somebody can come to rescue, which means then you can say, can I answer and put everybody out of their misery? That's how we do it. OK? Are we OK? So we're going to start from there so it's easier. Uh, do you remember what namespaces were? Don't try to be right. I want you to tell me something wrong so I can correct it, and in that manner, we're going to learn. Do you remember what namespaces were? Everything we write goes, goes inside a namespace. I don't have a namespace in main over here. Do you know why? I'm using it. I'm not having it. Uh, it may be due to uh, it do not have any conflicts with other file. We uh, oh, that, 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 operating with one file. That was a cool thing. So a na namespaces prevent conflicts. This is a review from what we had last thing, by the way. Okay, Namespaces prevent conflicts. So when we create modules, our modules are written inside a namespace. So we have namespace whatever, and everything goes in it. In main, we always use it. We do not create a namespace. So namespaces are in modules, and because modules are written by different departments, we don't want to have conflict in name creations. As we mentioned, for example, a teacher from HR and a teacher from education point of view are objects with the same name our cl uh, classes with the same name, structures with the same name, but the concept of it and the, uh, what was the name for it? Two different people looking at the same 
thing and have a different perspective. Remember? No, no, no. Uh, nice try, but that wasn't the one. No, when you are looking at, when you are looking at, uh, when two different programmers looking at two different designers looking at the same object and come with different conclusions, come with different implementations for the same object. No, poly polymorphism was, just to remind everybody, polymorphism was doing the same thing in a different way. I'm talking, she's talking. We have different tones of voice. That's polymorphism. Birds fly, airplanes fly. That's polymorphism, doing the same thing in a different way. But looking at an airplane from an airline point of view and looking at an airplane from a pilot, pilot point of view, I have two completely different implementations. An airline cares how many people are going to fit in an airplane, how many tickets they're going to get, how much money they're going to make. A pilot wants to know how to control and fly the airplane. So the objects, the implementation of the airplane object becomes two different things based on the business logic. We call this abstraction. Thank you. You said abstraction? Okay. 1% for midterm. Remind me of it. Okay. So abstraction. So abstraction is when you're looking at the same object and draw different conclusions based on your needs. That's why we have namespaces. Because two different departments can think about the same thing in different ways. Therefore, they're going to call airplane, structure airplane in aviation and structure airplane in airlines, in sales, let's call it. So airplane in sales namespace has a complete different uh, implementation that, than airplane in aviation. Therefore, we have namespaces not to have conflicts. So a quick review on those things. And um, remember what, uh, what uh, inheritance was in programmer's perspective? Anybody? You? Inheritance? Inherits another class. When one class inherits another class, what does it do? Remember, you can say pass. Because I, I come to you like, well, I don't want to ask. No, if you don't want me to ask questions. Just, I know sometimes you're not in a mood, but by the time we go through half of the semester, you know it's all fun. We are not trying to demean or anyone. We just go through it so we can. So remember what? Well, pardon me? Um, inheritance. He said when we create a class out of another class, what, essentially what we are doing when we do that. We inherit, so we inherit, so we, we are going in a, in, in a, in a <laughs> what is inheritance, inheriting one class. But when we are inheriting a class from another, we are reusing our code. We are reusing our design. So essentially, reusing design is inheritance. Now, the fact that I'm a teacher, I have an age, I have colors of eyes, I have gender, I have subjects that I teach, and at the same time, I can teach, I can walk and uh, I can present. So I can do things and I have specifications. What do we call this? Attributes, attributes are part of this. So when I have attributes, by the way, what is another name for attribute in C++? Attribute is object-oriented name for a Member function, member, member variable, sorry, member variable, member variable. So when we have attributes and beside attributes we have methods, what is a method? It's like that one, but it's not a, a variable. Member <coughs> function. So member functions are methods. When we have member functions and member, and, and member variables together in one class or one structure, what do we call that? Encapsulation. <laughs> Encapsulation. Perfectly correct. Thank you. The, 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 very good. 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 Yeah. So, so, so we are good, right? So, so next, next is you. <laughs> he was the last person. So be be aware. Okay. Are we okay down to this point? We're good. That was a quick review of what your object orientation was, and so we and I gave you an example. I wrote a little structure and I put stuff in it. Remember that? So forget about all that. I just wanted to tell you what we are about to learn, and we're gonna teach all these three that I went through in ten minutes throughout the whole semester. Okay? So let's begin. Too much light. Let me see if I can.
All right. Sorry if I'm putting the people in front and sleep, but one of the most important things in a classroom is to have a well-lit classroom. And sadly, only the back of the class is doing that. Anyways, uh, so let's talk about types in, uh, in C++, like what types do we have? So types that we have in C++ are exactly like C, no difference. Uh, we have, uh, oh, I need my microphone. We have two major types in C language. So if somebody asks you, like if somebody tells you like when we are dealing with uh, uh, types in C language, we're going to say we have two main category of types. I don't know if you remember that. Do you remember what are the main two category of types? You mean data types? Yeah, data types. Integer. you, you, integers and? and uh, integers and? Um, character? No. Character is an integer. Why did you say? Three passes. And then you can say, you have to wait for them to answer. <laughs> don't, don't forget the rules of the game. You let them, if you hear three passes, pass, 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 then you can actually come to rescue, OK? So yes, so we have two major categories of types. We have integrals, and we have real numbers. Real numbers are the ones that have partials. Integrals are the ones that they don't have partials. One, two, three, four, five integrals. And then we have 1.2, 2.2, 3.65, 3.14, 1.5, 9.26, whatever. So these are real numbers, OK? Now, each category of these two things, integrals, when we are dealing with integrals, do you remember the types that represent integrals in C language? You are exactly said the opposite. Integrals are the ones that have no partials. Doubles are half partial. So int, int, what else? Yeah. Int. No, double is real. Int. You can say pass if you, OK. How many different types of integer we have? We have int and character. character. Beautiful. So the other integer is character. There is no such thing as a character. There is no shape of A in a language. We don't have such a thing. We don't have character X or character A. Character A is an integer. What is that integer? Do you remember? Whoa, the code for character. The ASCII code for character A, you don't remember? It's 65, OK? So, <laughs> so, so 65 is actually the, the code for character A. There is no character. I give the compiler an integer and tell the compiler, print the shape that is uh, set or corresponding to this code. So I ask the compiler to print the code 65. The, and the compiler prints a capital A for me. And I think 92 is lowercase a, something like that. OK? So these are just integers. And what is the other type of integer that we have? So character int and pass. OK, so, so these are the types, which means we really need to know. <laughs> we don't know. So these are the types that we have that we can deal with as integers. So integer numbers or integrals. So ints are character, short, int, long, long, long. And I literally put it in ascending order. This goes up to only 256 if it's unsigned, and goes up to 128, 127, literally 127, not more than that. This one goes up to... 32,000 or 16,000. This one goes up to billion. This one goes more, and this one goes way more. I don't remember what. So, but, but I can tell you, this is 2 to power uh, 8. This is 2 to power 16. This is 2 to power 32. 2 to power 32 or 64, depending on what the machine is, and 2 to power 64. So 2 to power 64 is the biggest thing that we have. 
okay? So these are all the different types of integers that we have, okay? Now, doubles, what are the doubles? So, or real numbers. So real numbers are float, nobody uses, double, long double, okay? Goes, I think, around a uh, uh, number multiplied by 10 to 12, power 27 something, I think. The double goes uh, a number multiplied by 10 to power 328, I think, and this one goes way longer. Uh, so big, big numbers, okay? Now, can anybody tell me, nobody knows. What, like, let's say, what is the distance from here to sun? Millions of kilometers, right? Or whatever, I don't, I don't know, okay? So, but if I ask you how many centimeters, does that make sense? No, when you do kilometers, right? You don't do centimeters from here to sun. You really don't care about it, like, right? And you cannot be that precise. That's what real numbers are. So real numbers are never precise, especially the smaller they get the precision. That's why they call it that way. Float means a completely unprecise something. You do calculations with this, you're going to lose a few percents up and down through your calculation because they are not precise. You literally say float. A is equal to 2, and you look at it, it's actually 1.99999. So it's very bad, okay? Double is more precise. That's why they call it double, double precision. And this is long double, it means very precise. But again, the precisions are all relative. That's why you never compare the types that are, that are real. You can never confidently have two real numbers and say if A is equal to B. You can't do that. because it, Logically and mathematically, they may come to the result 42, but one of them is 41.999999, and the other one is 42.0000001. And for computer, these are unequal things. That's why when you are comparing these for equality, you always find out what the difference is, and then you see if the difference is smaller than certain values. So if I say A minus P, and the result is between minus 0, 0, 0, 0, 0001 and plus 0, 0, 0, 0001, it means the two are equal, depending on our precision, okay? These are all reviews of IPC 144. If you have not watched it, go watch the IPC. I, I feel the need for that in this class. Go watch the IPC 144 review that I posted the, the, the recording for it. No, that is good for your health. So. That's that. So those are the types that we have. And I, you know the syntax, C is C plus plus. I don't want this right over here, long A equals something, give you an example like that. You know what it is, we don't need to mention that. Okay, so uh, actually let me, what I'm gonna do over here, I'm just gonna click on it and just take a look at it and see what, what are the things we are supposed to teach. Hello. Nine on. Same for me. Unlike, okay, here comes the microphone. What is true in C language? I just came in. I know. That's why I'm asking. I want to warm you up. <laughs> what is true? In C language. One. Wrong. What is true in C language? Anything except zero. Anything except zero. Shame. Okay. So, so what is, what is, he is my, because, uh, because he, I, I, you're not in this class, are you? No. no. That's why I can pick on him. You know? <laughs> so, so. So what, it's not zero, anything that is not zero is true. That's the rule. And therefore, what is false? Zero. zero. Okay, so the only thing that is false is zero. Anything else is true. So if you have an if statement and you don't have a logical expression in there, you have some value in there, compiler checks to see if that value is zero or not. If it's zero, it's false. If it's not, it's true. So minus 592.3.5 is true, 
zero is false. 0 0.0000000000001 is true, but zero is false. Are we okay with this? That causes a little bit of confusion in, uh, for programmers. Uh, like they would, they would say, oh, come on, like we, in all languages we have truth and falsehood for heaven's sake. We need that in C, C++. To say the heck with it. Okay, we we're going to have a new type. We call it Boolean. <laughs> okay, Bool. It's literally B O O L. So B O O L is now a new type in C that we didn't have in C, and it's either true or false. So you can literally have something like this. So so you can literally have something like this. Bool. Um, okay, uh, and. Like that. Remember what I told you? What, what did? It, what was that? What? Who's the? Who was the next verse? I think that, we have to come right to the top. Uh, do you remember what em, that empty curly bracket is over there? When I put over there, do you remember that? I very slightly point that, pointed at it. Do you remember what it is? Like when I say okay. So what, if I say over here, let's put it like this. If I say over here, double price what does that mean anyone the default value so the default value of whatever it is which essentially means zero so don't bother putting zero in front of stuff this is better it means it's universal you can put it in front of anything and it defaults it if it's defaultable and if it's not you get an error so you know you cannot set this thing to default. So do it like that, okay? So, and if I, if I write over here, if I write over here, boo, okay, what is it going to be? What is it going to be? False, because the default is zero, and zero is false, therefore it will be false. Either I can do this, or I can actually say false. So now we have actually constant, we have literal values for, in, for integers. I can write 952. That's a literal value for an integer, correct? Literal values for Boolean is false and true. But they are all fake. False is zero. Literally, if you print false, it's going to print zero. And true is one. OK? So if you print true, it's going to print one. But the rules stand, which means anything that is not zero is true, not only the literal value true. So if I do over here, if OK, this will not happen, right? And I can say OK is true. If OK, see how this will happen. Are we good? Are we OK? Now I'm going to do this. I don't know. Let's see if it, ha if it makes sense. OK? Run forest run, you compile and run it. Bless you. And what's the result? One. So if you put a non zero value inside a Boolean, it turns it to one because that's what true is. Got it? And that is called casting. It is actually casting it. So it's casting two, three, four. To a boolean, therefore, it is true. Are we good? Are we okay? One. Are we okay? Two. All right. <laughs> All right. We are going somewhere. All right. So now we know what booleans are. Okay. So I'm going to call it a types dot. CPP. So you know what types are, and I'm going to continue to the next thing. Right.
read the I'm not gonna go through every single thing that it says that's why we have the quiz so you're gonna read this like your life depends on it after I'm done okay not before before you just glance before you come to class you just see okay definitions like we're gonna do these and that okay afterwards when you go home you really read them because I'm not going to go through every single thing over here. These are the things that you have to study by yourself. And then when you come to class, we'll continue. So this is extremely important. You don't do that, you're not going to be successful in the subject. Extremely careful. Okay? So unlike C language in C++, we are already mentioned this, and you know it. If I create a structure, struct, uh, what should we call it? Say uh, car. If I create a structure like that, unlike C language, you do not need to say struct car to create an instance out of it. C++, any structure you create becomes a type automatically after that. So if I want to create an array of types, I'm going to say over here car parking 200. I do not need to say struct car. So I have a parking that have 200 spaces for cars. Are you okay with this? Okay. We talked about preprocessor directives. You know what they are. Anything that starts with hashtag, it means you're talking to the compiler and asking compiler what to do. We went through that already. I'm not going to talk about that. Before we continue, I want to point to something important here. Before we continue, I want to point to something important here. And that's how the compiler works. If you were, oh, you were not, not never mind. But, oh, we have a new video editor, good. Anyway, so, so this is how the compiler works. Doesn't make sense, does it? No, let me explain what's going on. So when you write a program, you have several different modules. So we understand that, right? And in here, let's say I have the first one that is 1.cpp. The second one is 2.cpp. I have 3.cpp and main.cpp, right? Be okay with this? All right. So when the compiler compiles, when you actually run the compiler, how many files do I have? I have four files, right? So the command that you write or when you are Tap, uh, clicking on the compile button, whatever, or select build in Visual Studio, when you have four file, files, five things are getting executed. Five executions are going to happen. Okay? Number one, compiler will run four times completely separate execution. So it's not you're passing four files to the compiler. When you write name of four files to the compiler, it's as if you are executing the compiler command four separate times. And each separate compilation only compiles that individual files without compiler knowing any other file exists. That's why you have function prototypes. Because when compiler compiling this one has no idea there is 2.cpp. So if you actually want to use the functions in 2.cpp, you have to include its header file where it has the prototypes for the functions. So you're essentially promising to the compiler, hey, there are, translate this, don't worry, the functions are coming, they're somewhere else. Okay? So each individual ones get compiled by themselves. And if all these compilation translate to machine code properly, 
Then after that, the fifth one is called, that is called the linker, which essentially gets all the object files created out of these compilations, puts them together and makes one executable. And that linker checks to see if you promise, the promise you made in the header file telling that that function exists, really is it there or not? So if you hear, see a message that says function yada yada does not exist, it's not the compiler. It's the linker telling you, you promised there is a function that you called in, in module A, but I don't find it in any other modules. So that's how the compiler works, okay? Remember that. This is extremely important. Are we okay with this? So that's that. That's how the compiler works. Stage, so essentially, and in here I gave you the example for safeguard compilation. Safeguards, you already know it. We talked about it. In here I'm saying main is using, you know, main is uh, using the three modules over here. So it includes 1.cpp and 2.cpp, right? But CPP, uh, 3.cpp is using 2.cpp and it has an include inside its include, which it shouldn't actually, but sometimes you have to. If you include 3.cpp, then 2.cpp is included twice without you knowing. And that causes problem. You have one definition rule. You cannot have two definitions. You cannot have two prototypes identical of a function. You cannot have two structures with exactly the same name in the same namespace. Therefore, you get an error. So you have to force it not to get compiled more than once, hence the compilation safeguards we talked about. We good? All right. So that's compilation. I need to put that thing out of the way, and then we are going to talk more about this. So, okay, so uh, the, what was this one? This one was struct being so. So, in here, I'm going to say B structs. And in here, I'm going to say classes are types. Just remember, OK, any structure you create, and you will soon see, we're going to replace this word with class. OK, soon we're going to replace the word struct with class. You'll see why. They are identical things. It's just minor differences that we're going to get to it when the time comes. Are we OK down to this point, people? Are we OK one? RBOK2. All right. I'm going to pause for a second. So that's that. Back in IPC 144. We had that graph thingy for, for, for our workshop, right? That actually drew a graph, and we had a line function over there, right? So how, how did the line function work? So we had something like this. We wrote something like, let's say I can write over here, void, line, and I use some kind of a character to, to, to draw the line with, right? So I'm going to call that character fill, OK? I'm filling the line with. And then I need to have a, uh, uh, what should we call it? Uh, uh, a type of a character to, uh, a, a number of characters to draw the line, how long I want the line be. So in here, I'm going to put some kind of an integer, which I'm going to introduce you to a new type in C++ that is a type that is used for sizes, anything that is positive only. Okay? They call that size T. It essentially means unsigned integer. Remember what unsigns are from, from C, from C language? When you add an unsigned, it removes the negative parts of an integer, and the size becomes double. OK? So how many fingers? 10. If I want to go negative and positive, I have to go minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? So the biggest number I can show with 10 fingers is 4 and minus 1. Right? And this one becomes 0, correct? As soon as I make it unsigned, what happens? It becomes 0 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. That's why the positive numbers are always one less than negative ones when you look at it. When you look at a character, the biggest number in a character is 127, and the smallest one is minus 128, right? So it's the same thing with all of the stuff. Because the number of uh, bits that it can represent is uh, even, when you want to make one zero, there is no middle one. So they put the zero with positives, <laughs> OK? That's why, what happens. So, oh, there you go. Good, it's coming up, so I'm going to say dismiss. Oh, and um, hopefully it's going to send me a message telling me that uh, my next class is beginning. So, there, it doesn't make sense that I have a negative number over here for the length of a line. I cannot have minus three characters, right? So, either I can remove the negative part and call this thing unsigned. I can say unsigned. Int, which essentially means take the negative parts out and it's only positive, zero and positive. Or in short, you can say, and this is a type, it's not um, a metaphor or anything, it's size t. So, and I'm going to use it right off the bat so you know what I'm talking about. When I say size t, that means it represents a size, it's a positive integer, okay? And size t over here, I'm going to call it uh, length. So that's my line, and I'm going to write the code for that line over here. So essentially, I'm going to say, what am I going to say? Let me just, OK. So I can say over here, um, uh, for integer i, or sorry, size t, i, and i less than len, and i plus plus, right? I plus plus, then what do I do over here? I'll go see out, fill, correct? Right? And at the end, I'll go to new line. See out, and I'll go to new line. Are we okay with this? Any problem with this beautiful code of mine? Good, right? Okay. So if I say over here, line, say with dashes and uh, 40, what I'm going to get over here will be a line that is 40 characters long. I have build errors only, seriously? <laughs> this is amazing. What did I do wrong? Oh. Oh, uninitialized. I forgot to initially initialize it. Sorry. It says you have a... Uh, an integer i and you didn't initialize it, okay? But So uh, let's do like that. There we go. So I have 40 of them, right? Are we okay? Are we okay? Are you sure? You're okay? All right. All right. So, and not to just, I put that one to show you that that could be anywhere. But just to make people who are doing C comfortably, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Integer i is equal to 0. It's the same thing, right? Remember? OK. So <clears throat> now, what if I want to just draw a line? And when I say I want a line, I want it to be 79 characters or 70 characters. I don't want the length. I want to just draw, draw a line. If I wanted to do that in C language, I had to write another one, something like uh, function, write, some, write, write a function like void full line, and I'll go character fill, and I do not put any size for it. Then I'll come over here and I'm going to say void full line, character fill, and obviously I'm going to reuse my code saying line, fill, and 70 characters. Whoa, what did I do? 70 characters, right? And now if I draw a full line over here, say with the assignment operator, it's going to show it as follows. Are we OK with this? But we have a polymorphic language. C++ is a polymorphic language, which means you can do the same thing 
in different ways. And it's the compiler's job, it's the language's job to find out which one is the proper one to pick. Therefore, unlike C language, you don't need to name this thing differently. As long as the arguments are different, which means you are doing the same thing in a different way, you can call it the exact same thing. There is no conflict. That's the first polymorphic thing that you see in C++. The functions can have same name as long as the arguments are different. Are we good? Are we OK? So I can have different versions of this line. I can say, OK, if somebody wants to draw a line and only mention the size, size t len, then I want that to be void line size t len, and I want that to uh, uh, draw a line for me. You can have a different code. I'm reusing it. I am reusing this, but I don't have to if I, you know what I mean? I'm just reusing because I'm lazy. Okay, so in here I can actually say draw a line. Let's say if somebody doesn't tell how they want to draw, I'm going to use dash for it, and I'm going to put over here len. So let's make that one different. I'm going to have plus over here, plus, OK? And I can have over here something like line 60 and run the code, OK? Let's see if this is going to work. What is it going to tell me? More than one instance matches the line. Does it? They look very different, don't they? Don't they look different? There is no way for compiler to understand if this thing that is an ASCII code. So if I write over here, let's do it like this. And I'm going to remove this length thingy for now. OK, so I don't have the length one. If I say line A like that, it's going to print that thing with A's, correct? Now, if I write over here 65 or 66, what's going to happen? What did we say about characters? They are integers, right? So that single quotes you put around your single quotes you put around your, the thing, it's just because we don't have a good memory. I want the 66. But I don't remember it. That's why I put the single quotes telling the compiler, please give me the code for this thing. OK? So don't try to confuse. So it's what I mean is that the compiler can go with this what this is called overloading a function. So overloading a function is one of the aspects of polymorphism. Don't make it complicated. Don't have things that they don't match. If one is double, the other one is integer, they're, they're really different now. They, it can be selected. But if one of them is a character and the other one is an integer, there might be some problems. Careful. Don't overdo it. OK? Don't write something that gets you confused, because if you get confused, the compiler gets confused. Are we okay with this? All right. In conflict with line care since care is integral. All right? Are you okay with this? All right. So let's go back. I want to clean this up and go back to my line. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say overloading intro.cpp. So I'm going to clean that thing up that I did. And I don't want to write something messy. Well, you can always overload in some other ways, writing void only line, and say, if I do that, 
if I only write, and let's put this one over here, something like, like that. And you can say, if somebody wants just to draw a line, that essentially means drawing a line with dashes and 70 characters, if you just say line. Okay, so if you don't mention what, and you just say line. So now that's a valid overloading. Now I have three different lines. Are we okay? Questions? Suggestions? Objections? All right. What happened? Oh, <laughs> wrong window. Now, overloading can be done for any type of function, even member functions. Don't, don't forget about that. We are giving you example of standalone functions for now until we, under, we, we teach encapsulation. When we go through encapsulation, then you'll know what we are talking about. You can overload anything, okay? <clears throat> but C++ has another beautiful feature, which is, I'm going to say, Instead of doing this, I'm not going to draw the line, put the line over here. I'm going to tell to the compiler, hey, if they didn't provide the fill, if they didn't provide the fill when they were calling the function, please replace it with dash for me. So in the prototype of the function, you simply write what you want it to be replaced with if not provided. Here, it is being provided, so that's not going to be used. But in this one, it, it is not provided. Therefore, it's going to pick up the value that you have. We OK with this? All right? So if I actually run this code, it will still run. Right? And I'm going to, and so essentially, this we call this default argument values. OK, so this one, I keep going to the text file. So this becomes default argument values. But even you can go further, which means you can actually say, hey, couldn't I do that just at the top? Even get rid of this one and come over here, remove that one. And I say, OK, this one is going to be uh, dash, if you write this, that's wrong. <laughs> because we cannot miss the first one and provide the second one. It has to start from the right side. So if you are having this one, the other one must have one too. So in here, I'm going to say, now the default for that one will be 75. Now this is good. So what happens, this one both are provided, so the values are completely ignored. This one or the only one is the first one is provided. Therefore, it's going to uh, use the default for length, but fill will be equal. And this one for both of them is going to be, right? So just remember that this can only happen. This can only happen if your function is using the same logic with different number of arguments. But sometimes two functions have completely different logics. In that case, you can't do this. OK? Are we OK? All right. All right, so that's overloading. So overloading is which feature of object orientation? Polymorphism. There is another feature of polymorphism that you already know from IPC 144, which was casting. You use plus sign, the, the, the operator plus, between everything, right? You have plus, double, and a double. Plus, int, and int. Plus, int, and a double. Right? And you put an assignment. At left side, you put an int. At right side, you put a double. At left side, you put an int. At right side, you put, an int, put uh, a long. At left side, put an int. At right side, you put a float. What does it do? The, it casts it to, to temporary so for things can happen. 
that's considered polymorphism too. Okay, it's a very fake type of polymorphism, but it's polymorphism. Are we good? All right. And quite frankly, I have to tell, oh, this is the old version, but it's okay. Quite frankly, when you think about it, this is fake too. You know why it's fake? When I say it's fake polymorphism, real polymorphism is really when you have a function a method, an action, and that action happens differently based on the circumstances, not passing the arguments only. How does the compiler implement this? In C++, they said, we're going to add something to the signature of a function. The signature of functions in C language were only the name, which means if you had two functions with the same name, it wouldn't work because the signature would be repeated and signature should be something unique, right? In C++, they said, the heck with it. Let's just attach the types to the name. So the first function behind the scene is called line char size t. The second one behind the scene is called line char. Therefore, there are two different functions, right? But we are faking it. And we accepted that polymorphism. So it's an, a feature of polymorphism. At the end of the semester, you're going to see which category it's going to fall into. But that's what it is. Are we OK down to this point? All right. I'm not rushing through these things because these are important stuff that we, you need to know and, and, and step by step. So we'll, we, we may be a little late, but it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll manage. All right. Now, let's talk about, let's talk about something that nobody admits, but most of you have problem with for some unknown reason. And that's called pointers. So I'm going to start teaching pointers as I teach it for IPC 144, as if you know nothing about pointers. OK? I'll do it that way. And then after that, when, when it fits, we're going to go to the next feature. It's getting warm in here. Can't believe it's like minus, what, 14 out there? All right. You see, in Alberta, it hit minus 50. It was colder than than North Pole. My friend was saying we're going to go North Pole <laughs> for vacation because that's minus 40. Here is minus 50. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, that's interesting. OK. So to do that, I have to hide the screen for a second. Do something behind the scenes so you don't see. All right, give me a second. Let me pause. So, I don't use slide and stuff like that, but this one needs lots of illustration. I don't want to, my hands dirty with a marker. So, that's why it's one of the rare times that you see I put uh, a slide up. Uh, so that's the representation of the memory of your computer. Memory of your computer is essentially a long array of characters, a long array of bytes, a long array of integers that is 256, uh, 8 bits, maximum 256 by value. And each one has an index. So the very beginning of your memory has index 0, and it keeps going to whatever money you have in your pocket. The bigger the RAM it is, the bigger your, the size of the memory is. So when I say over here 144, I mean 234, 23144. It means a big number. So I just put the first three over here. So let's assume that these numbers are ginormous, gotten very big. Are we getting down to this point? OK. This illustration has a boo-boo that I didn't fix. And it's been like there for 10 years. And every time I say, I made a mistake, just ignore it. I missed. <laughs> 
the byte 124 here. <laughs> Supposed to be another thing over here called 124 and then goes to 125. So byte 124 is missing in this one. This is not supposed, it's supposed to have another thing over here. Okay. One day I maybe fix it. So imagine that there is a 124th byte over here and then goes to byte 125 and it continues. Are we okay with this? So this is the memory that you have. <clears throat> and that's everything about your computer. That's how the CPU works. CPU puts stuff in memory, does its processing, and then puts the values back, and then they get the results. And so memory is everything with computers. It's the only reason the computer can work. So it can remember things. So when in your program you, you, do, you say something like integer var, what happens is that the compiler asks the operating system to give you a piece of memory and calls that one var. It doesn't actually ask the operating system, quite frankly. It actually puts it inside the executable. So when you have int var like that, four bytes will be added to the size of your executable program. And if you create an array of 5,000 characters, then 5,000 multiplied by four bytes will be added to the size of your executable. So when compiler brings the computer into memory, it brings your executable into memory, you're going to have your variable over there. You can use it and you can do anything you want through it. Are we okay with this? But that's not always what we want. And the same thing happens if you say a double. Like if I actually write over here double, then it's going to have another piece of memory. This one is 8, and it's going to put that one. Now, what is the address of var in here? What is the address? Address means index. Why well, everybody's looking at me? What is the address of var? 108, 108, right? It's not a big mystery, okay? It's what it begins with. And dvar is 132. Are we okay with this? Okay. So when we do something like this, and when you actually set a value, the value is turned into binary, and it's put inside the variable. So if I say var is that value, it goes over there. And if I say dvar is that value, it goes over there. Are we okay with this? Okay. So let's go back to the thing. Now, they kept doing that, but the memory got bigger and bigger. You cannot make your executable hey, bigger and bigger as you go, right? So what they did, they said, instead of doing that, let the program run. And when it's running, instead of putting the value inside the executable, while the program is running, I'm going to ask the compiler to give me the, the operating system to give me some memory, OK? And so what happens? That's, that's, what, that's, what they do, that's what they want to do. So they said, we cannot just have variables. We need to know where something is in memory. For that, we need a type. So integers got expanded with one more type. And they call those pointers. Pointer is essentially an integer, an unsigned integer that is supposed to hold an index. That's all. So they said, we can actually create a variable, and we call that variable pointer, pointer PTR. OK? And then what we do, we can actually, if I act, and PTR is just like a variable. It's, a, it's an integer in, in, in your executable. And it has a space that you can put stuff in it. So I can set that pointer to a, to a number. 102, and when I do that, essentially, I mean that I want to do something with memory address 102, which means that pointer is going to point to 102, correct? So that's difficult because, because nobody knows. The, 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 your compiler doesn't tell you where your variable is. You don't know. So you cannot hard code the address in here. They said, instead of doing that, uh, and, and you have to actually adjust that and break it 108 so it actually points to another variable. Correct? So that's impossible. You don't know what is the address of a variable. Because of that fact, they added another thing called address of. So you can say pointer is address of var. No matter where your executable sits, it extracts that value and puts it over there. You don't care what it is as long as it's pointing to it. Are we okay with this? 
So essentially, if I actually, if I actually write, and then they created something else called target of. They say target of PTR is 234. So what happens, it says, not the PTR. If I say PTR is something, that's the address that goes into PTR itself. But when I say target of PTR is something, it means not PTR, go to what it's pointing to. And therefore, what does it do? Does that. Are we okay with this? There is a problem here. Let's, let, and, and of course, when you, you can, if you print the variable, what you see is the 2345 is going to come out. If you print target of PTR, again, 2345 is going to get printed. If you print the pointer itself, the address is going to get printed because you are printing the pointer, not target of a pointer. Correct? The address is going to get printed. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? So this is all English. Are we okay with this? Right? So let's go back. What if I want to set the pointer to point to the double? I have to say address of dvar, correct? And then doing so, I want to say target of PTR is 2345 point, yada, 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 right? Well, and then as a result, I want this thing to go there, correct? But can I? How does this pointer know what's sitting at the end? It's just an address. Last time, it covered four bytes for me to put an integer. How does it know it has to put eight bytes in here? It doesn't know. When you look at an address on an envelope, if it doesn't tell you what it is, do you know what that address is? No. It could be someone's home. It could be a government building. It could be a hospital. You don't know. From an address, you cannot watch sitting at the target. It is impossible. They said, the heck with it. This design is bad. Let's not do this. Instead of do so, this is impossible. We can't do this. So instead of doing this, let's actually tell what type of a pointer. So I have to say integer pointer PTR. So now PTR knows it is pointing to an integer and problem is solved. Do we understand this? So essentially what I'm saying is I can actually have something like this. What I can say, I can say integer A is 25, correct? Are we okay with this? Then I can say integer pointer uh, P is equal to address of uh, A, correct? Is it address of? Give me a second. Let me check. Give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. Sorry, O is capital. I made a mistake. It's address of. Okay, so now P holds address of A, correct? Now if I say target of A, uh, target of P is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? If I say C out A, what's going to get printed in here? Correct? If I run the program, I'm going to get an error. Why? Uh, why am I getting an error? Give me a second. It shouldn't get an error. Let me stop this. Uh, get down. I don't want to present now. So integer pointer. P is address of A. That's correct. And target of P is 1, 2, 3, and print it. Why is it giving me an error? Mm. Give me a second. This should work, I think. I, let me just check.
Let me pause. OK? So now, if I run the program, sorry. If I run the program, it runs and you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, OK? Are we OK with this? So have you seen these keywords before? You've never seen it before, right? This is why. I said, whenever you see target of, replace it with asterisk. Whenever you see address of, replace it with ampersand. Whenever you see pointer, replace it with asterisk. So what happens is this. This is how they design the language. And the reason we have problem understanding these is that we need to say the name, not the operator name. We say integer star p. And that doesn't fit in our brain. I'll explain. Give me two seconds. So, so, so now when I have, where was I? So this is the, the integer one, and we went to dos. So now I can have double pointer DPTR. Same thing over here. And everything happens. So pointer is C is represented by asterisk. So when you say pointer, it's an asterisk. So whenever you see pointer, you should put an asterisk inside. You see that? So remember, and that's how it is, right? So, and the asterisk belong to the type. The next thing is that address of. Address of is ampersand. So wherever you see ampersand, uh, address of, you replace it with an ampersand. Target of, unfortunately, is represented with asterisk too. That's what confuses out of everyone. And again, I'm going to change the target of, and this is what happens, right? So that's the syntax that you saw in C. So target of and pointer are both presented by asterisk. How do we find out which one is which? It's very simple, actually. If the star comes after a type, that means a type pointer. Don't call it type asterisk. When you see car asterisk p, Say car pointer P. Don't say car asterisk car star. Really name it. So you see an asterisk coming after type. That always means pointer. Integer pointer PTR, double pointer DPTR, struct employee because it was C. I put struct. In your case, it's only employee star EPTR. It means it's a pointer to an employee. So if asterisk comes after a type, that's that one. If it comes in front of a variable as a unary operator, unary operator means it only has one operand, like minus 5, plus 3, not 5. If you put star A, that means target of. Don't say anything else. Call it target of. You do that, and you'll get it exactly what's good. What does it say? You're not going to be confused anymore. OK? So that means target of. Essentially, if I say something like, a is equal to target of P, or target of T is equal to X, or A is equal to B multiplied by target of C. Now, when, well, what I usually tell to my students is that when asterisk makes sense and you look at it, oh, okay, that means multiplication. Okay? When it comes after a type, it's a pointer. When you go, what the heck? That means target of. OK? So that's what it is. OK? So, so we can have stuff like something like equal, E equals target of M multiplied by C multiplied by C. OK? The first one doesn't make sense, right? So that's target of M multiplied by C multiplied by C. Are we OK with this? And that's pointers, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. We don't need anything else about it. If you follow that rules, as I told you, Everything's crystal clear. You don't need to worry about anything. Okay? So that's that. I know I don't give, they don't give you a break. In this class, we're going to have the break at the end because I have to run. I have five minutes to go to. So we're going to go earlier. Instead of 9, 9.45, it ends, right? I'll try to make it earlier, something like 9.35. So you go 10 minutes earlier. Okay? instead of have a, having a break. So come with your coffees, 
and water and stuff like that. And bear with me and my apologies. I know you're yawning and it's very difficult to sit in this class, especially after bad traffic. So, all right. So now we know what pointers are. Good for us. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Now, pointers is what scares the bejesus out of everyone, right? So let me, so I'm going to call this fake pointers. And the reason for it not working is that that's one of the rules of including. That's one of the rules of doing include, which means your includes must happen after the system includes. If you put it before, it's going to mess up with that. Okay, so make sure your include is always after the system include. You good? You okay? All right. Because apparently some variable in here is called pointer in IO stream. And when I defined pointers to change to asterisk, essentially I screwed all the ice cream header files. Okay, so that's why I'm having it after. It means after everything is included, <laughs> replaced in it. So that fake pointer is over there. Okay, so I'm going to call this fake pointers. So the EFG. I have a request. My name is Fardat. I even I pronounce it badly because it's it's not it's not it's not Fardat that I it's actually Fardot. The guy who wrote my name in a passport didn't know English, he just wrote it incorrectly. I was supposed to be F A R D A U D, so that actually becomes Fardot. It's actually correct. That's the way it's supposed to be. But could you please call me Freddy from now on? So my name is gonna be Freddy. Okay? So are we okay with this? So, who's Freddy? Who's Fardad? If you ask Freddy to teach, who's going to teach? Which is? Fardad. If you ask Fardad to teach, who's going to teach? Right? Are we all okay with this? We have that in C++. You can actually, you can actually give stuff new names. Okay? So, 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 and that's just making the things a little more confused, confusing. Now you'll see. So in here, I'm going to say integer A, right? And I'm going to set A to 2, 3, 4, okay? And by the way, the same thing goes over here. You can actually do this, <laughs> believe it or not. Instead of writing equal, you can write it like that if you want to be a geek. That happens to. That's in three, four, five. We'll do that because that's the universal way of, uh, of of initialization. You could do that too. If you leave it empty, it means default. If you put something in it, it means set to it. But not gonna go that far yet. Two, three, four. So now I can say integer. What was pointer? If I wanted to make it a pointer, what do I put? Asterisk, right? If I want to make this, essentially, if I, if I say call me Freddy, Freddy is my, what we call that in English, what? Freddy is Fardad's and alias, right? Alias, it's, because, it's an alias, right? Aliases in C, they are called references, in C++, they're called references. So to make the matters work, worse, now ampersand is coming over here. So if ampersand, is coming after the type, it's called reference. Don't call it ampersand anymore. So in here, I'm going to say integer reference r is set to a. Do I have two variables? No, one, right? If I set a, what is being set to a? If I print r, what's going to get printed? A. And after line five, there is no way to distinguish which one was the original. Remember that. After line five, R 
is a. As a matter of fact, unlike other variables, you cannot leave references uninitialized. Because it doesn't make sense. You cannot say, Jack is an alias. Alias for what? Or who? You have to mention alias for who, right? Right? It's the same thing. When you create a reference, you cannot just leave it like that. It's an error. You have to set it to something. So now if I call it over here A, and I print R, obviously, I'm going to have 2, 3, 4 printed. And if I say over here A is set to, um, if I say R is set to 4, 3, 2, and I print A, 4, 4, 3, 2 is printed. Are we clear on that? So if I run forest from this, this thingy, you'll see that the answer is exactly what we expected. That creates an amazing side effect. That is what? So I'm going to save this as EFGGH. I'm going to say references intro. OK. This is going to create an amazing side effect. Before that, I have to mention something again from IPC 144. OK. What the devil is that E? I have no idea. OK. So. When you call a function, what really happens? They never told you that in IPC 144, I presume. When you call a function, this happens. So first, let's do this. I'm sorry. Yeah. Pause that thought and listen to this. I want to make something clear that is going to define if you are a C or you're an A plus till the end of the, till the end of three, four, five. I want you to listen to this carefully because it's a critical moment. I'm going to remove this for now. So foo, forget about foo. Foo is not important. I'm just having an X over there, right? OK. What is the output? 34, right? What is the output? Then what the heck is the difference? And the other one? What does that mean? OK, so one was initialized, and the other one was set. What does that mean? Who's going to be the hero? You are. What is the difference between initialization and setting? Do you know that? Do you know what's the difference between initialization and setting? Anyone? Yes, sir. Maybe when we initialize it, have maybe the garbage values in it. Thank you. Thank you. You already got the 1% for the thing, right? Sorry, you're not going to get the next one. OK, so, so you, only, you only can score once in a session, OK? But Please answer questions. You get. So when you do something like this, x is initialized, which means at no moment of time, x has anything other than 34 in it. When x is born, it's 34 inside. We understand this? In the other one, At a fraction of a second, billionth of a second, x has garbage in it, and you override that garbage with 34. 
So the assignment at the moment of creation is a completely different beast than an assignment as a command. Assignment at the moment of creation is the curly bracket. That's why they could change it to a curly bracket. Because assignment at the moment of creation is not assignment. It's initialization. It's a completely different thing. That's why they change it to curly bracket to completely separate the meanings. When you create, when you do an assignment halfway through the thing, the object already exists. You have another object. You set one object to the value of the next object, correct? But when you put the assignment at the moment of creation, it essentially means build it with that. And you can do it in three different ways. You, I can write it like this. So I can write it like this. That's one version. You can write int y34. You can write int z34. They are all the same. The results of all are the, why am I getting in here? Oh, because I have only one Schmigli dinghy here. Okay, and if I run it, you'll see they are all the same. Got it? Please imprint that in your long-term memory and remember that. Assignment at the moment of creation is not assignment. It's a completely different thing called initialization and it can be translated into two more ways. Are, are we okay with this? Now let's go back to the function thingy. So in here I'm gonna say <clears throat> EFGHI assignment, assignment, wow that's gonna be a long name, assignment at the moment of creation is initialization.cpp for you to remember, okay? It's extremely important to know. It is not assignment. Are we okay with this now? All right, let's go back to what I wanted to talk about in here. So in here, when I say int x, 34, 35 is good too, 35, and in here I'm gonna say foo, 40, and then I'm going to say, what am I going to say, a foo x, how does the function foo get called? This is how it's called. When the, first of all, when main is running, foo is not involved, there is no int a, nothing is there. As soon as it's called, foo is called in this way. This is literally how it's called. So the argument of a function is initialized with the value that you have passed to it. Appreciate the word initialize there. Do we understand this? So when you call a function, any argument in a function you have, they are being initialized by the value you are passing to it. Are we okay? Now let's talk about the beautiful side effect that I was talking about from references. So this one is going to be EFGHIJ, how functions are called. Okay, now let's come over here and let's take a look at this. When I say foo x, what's going to be the result? A, as you see, when it's an argument, it doesn't give me an error. Why? Because it's not created. References cannot just exist by themselves, right? When the function is called, when the function is called,
it is assigned. What does it mean? A becomes a new name for X, correct? Therefore, when I print this, obviously, it's going to print 34, correct? But even better, look at this. For scenarios like this, you don't need pointers anymore. No more target of no more stuff like that. If you want something to change in a function, pass its reference. It cannot be an array. Array is not a single thing, only for single things. Array is not a single thing. Array is many things. Are we okay down to this point? Two minutes left. <laughs> She's packing. <laughs> Are we okay with this? So these are references. So understand what references are. And I'm going to end it with this to understand why arrays cannot be passed as references. When you create an array, use int var, a, a, an integer is created. When you create a pointer, you can actually set the pointer point to the variable, correct? Now, an array works like this, so, and then you do all the good stuff and it happens. When you create an array and you say integer a r5, actually five integers are created in memory, correct? But the interesting part is that actually behind the scene, this is what's happening. a r is actually a pointer pointing to the beginning of the array. So if you say target of AR, the first element is going to get printed. Pointers are nothing, uh, arrays are nothing but a pointer pointing to a bunch of stuff instead of only one thing. And because of that target of business being very difficult, they created the index. But the meaning is the same. So essentially, when you do something like this, if I say target of AR is 2, 3, 4, 5, the first one is going to be 2, 3, 4, 5. If I say AR2 is 444, four, it's going to be that one. And most important one, if I say target of AR2 is equal to 555, five, five, is the same as AR2. No difference. Why? Because in here, <clears throat> why? Oh, 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 oh. Why? Because in here, I'm saying from the address of AR, go it two integers further. From the address of AR, go one and two integers further. Now write. Ta-da. And that's the difference between a pointer and an integer. To an integer, you add one, one will be added. To a pointer, you add one, the size of the target will be added to it. So if it's pointing to a double, AR will be plus by eight. If it's pointing to a st structure that is 200 bytes, 200 will be added to it. And that's how uh, arrays are, are implemented. And this is C, not C++. That's why you cannot pass a reference of an array, because array is not a single thing. It's a mechanism that is going back there. Arrays still work the same old-fashioned way that we did, but single stuff, you can pass them with references. Are we good? Have a beautiful day.